A Day in London by Theophile Gautier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. A Day in London by Theophile Gautier for the Tales of the Cities compilation. After leaving Gravesend, the lower boundary of the port of London, stores, warehouses, and yards crowd together and mass with quite a picturesque irregularity. To the left rise the two cupolas of the Royal Naval Hospital, Greenwich, through the open colonnade of which we catch a glimpse of park depths with great trees, producing a charming effect. Seated on the steps of the peristyle, the invalids watch the departure and arrival of the ships that form the subject of their souvenirs and conversations, and the sharp scent of the sea again delights their nostrils. Sir Christopher Wren was the architect of this fine building. Greenwich faces the Isle of Dogs, which, however, is not completely an island, but lies in a loop of the Thames, of which skilful use has been made. It is here that the West India Company has excavated its docks. The East India docks, much smaller and less frequented, are to the right, a little higher up, and at the extremity of the curve made by the river. The West India docks are something enormous, gigantic, fabulous, and almost beyond human proportions. They are the work of cyclops and titans. Above the tops of the houses, shops, embankments, flights of steps, and all the hybrid constructions that line the banks of the river, you see a prodigious forest of ship's masts extending to infinity an inextricable mass of rigging, spars, and cordage that, by the density of their lacing, would shame the most fibrous bine-weeds of an American virgin forest. Here it is that are built, refitted, and repaired that innumerable army of vessels that go out in search of the riches of the world in order, afterwards, to pour them into that bottomless gulf of misery and luxury called London. The West India docks can hold three hundred vessels. A canal, dug parallel with the docks, cutting through the Isle of Dogs and called the City Canal, shortens the distance it would take to double the point by three or four miles. The commercial docks on the opposite bank, the London docks and the St. Catherine docks just below the tower, are no less wonderful. In the commercial docks, are the biggest cellars in the world. The wines of Spain and Portugal are stored there. Besides these, there are private docks and basins. Each instant, amid a group of houses, you see a ship take up position. The yards put out the eyes of the windows. The spars penetrate into the rooms, and the cutwaters seem to be making breaches in the doors of the shops, like ancient battering rams. The houses and ships live in the most touching and cordial intimacy. At high tide the yards become basins and receive ships. Flights of steps, slips constructed of stone, granite, and brick mount and descend from the river to the houses. London has her arms plunged into her river up to the elbows. A regular quay would obstruct the familiarity between the river and the city. This is a gain in picturesqueness, for nothing is more horrible than those eternal straight lines, prolonged in spite of everything, with which modern civilization is so stupidly infatuated. England is only a dockyard. London is only a port. The sea is the natural fatherland of the English. They take such delight in it that many of their great lords spend their lives in making the most dangerous voyages in little vessels equipped and managed by themselves. The Yacht Club has no other aim than to encourage and favor this taste. The land is so unpleasing to them that they have a hospital stationed in the middle of the Thames, in a great hulk which serves the sailors who are ill in the port of London. The fronts of all these houses are turned towards the river, for the Thames is London's great highway, the artery from which the veins branch to carry life and circulation into the body of the city. Therefore, what a riot of inscriptions and signs! 
Letters of all colors and sizes cover the edifices from top to bottom. The characters often reach the height of one story. The houses, thus streaked, placarded, and variegated with lettering, when seen from the middle of the Thames, present the most outlandish appearance. I was not a little surprised to see the tower intact. It has lost nothing of its ancient physiognomy. It is still there, with its high walls, its sinister attitude, and its low arch, the Traitor's Gate, under which a black boat, more sinister than Charon's bark, brought criminals in and came to carry the condemned away to death. The tower is not, as its name would seem to indicate, a donjon or solitary belfry. It is a regular Bastille, a cluster of towers connected by walls, a fortress surrounded by moats supplied by the Thames, with cannons and drawbridges, a fortress of the Middle Ages, at least as serious as our Vincennes, containing a chapel, a treasury, an arsenal, and a thousand other curiosities. We were approaching the end of our voyage. A few more turns of the wheel, and the steamboat touched the custom-house quay, where the passengers' trunks would not be examined till the morrow, for in London Sunday is observed as scrupulously as the Sabbath by the Jews in Jerusalem. I shall never forget the magnificent spectacle presented to my eyes. The big arches of London Bridge reached across the river with their five great limbs and stood out somberly against a background of setting sun. The disk, fiery like a shield reddened in a furnace, was sinking exactly behind the central arch, which traced a black segment of incomparable boldness and vigor above the orb. A long trail of fire scintillated and trembled upon the rippling waves. Violet smoke and mist bathed space as far as Southwark Bridge, the vaguely sketched arches of which were scarcely perceptible. To the right, a little in the background, flamed the gilded bronze of the summit of the tall column erected to commemorate the fire of 1666. To the left, the belfry of St. Clive, projected above the roofs, monumental chimney-stacks that might be taken for votive columns of Ionic or Doric capitals, were they not in the habit of vomiting smoke, in a most happy manner, broke the horizon lines, and accentuated the orange and pale lemon tints of the sky with their strong tones. On turning round, behind you, is a red naval city, with quarters and streets of vessels, for it is at this, the first of the London bridges, that ships stop. We disembarked. When the cab was rapidly rolling through the streets between the Custom House and High Holborn, I looked out of the window and was greatly astonished at the solitude and profound silence that reigned. You might have called it a dead town, one of those cities inhabited by people turned to stone that Oriental stories tell of. All the shops were shut, and no human face appeared at the windows. Occasionally a rare figure passed along the walls like a shadow. This doleful and deserted aspect, so strongly contrasted with the idea of noise and animation that I had formed of London, that I could not get over my surprise, till at length I remembered that it was Sunday. And the London Sunday had been held up to me as the ideal of weariness. On that day, which with us, at least for the common people, is a day of joy, promenade, dress, feasting, and dancing, on the other side of the channel is spent in inconceivable sadness. The taverns close at midnight on Saturday, the theatres do not open, the shops are hermetically shut up, and it would be very difficult for a man to get anything to eat unless he has made provision beforehand. Life seems to be suspended. The machinery of London ceases to work, like the wheels of a clock when you put your finger on the pendulum. For fear of profaning dominical solemnity, London does not dare to move. It will scarcely allow itself even to breathe. On that day, after having listened to the pastor of the sect in which he belongs, every good Englishman shuts himself up within the walls of his house to meditate on the Bible 
to offer his weariness to God, and to enjoy in front of a big coal fire the happiness of being at home, and of being neither a Frenchman nor a Papist, a source of inexhaustible bliss. At midnight the charm is broken. Circulation, that had stopped for a moment, starts again. The houses lie open. Life returns to this great body that had fallen into lethargy. The Dominical Lazarus is resuscitated at the brazen voice of Monday and resumes its march. The shops are slow to open. Paris gets up earlier than London. It is not till about 10 a.m. that London begins to awake. It is true that it goes to bed much later. Since the occupants are not yet up, let us take note of the dwellings. Let us describe the nest before the bird. The English houses have no porte cochins, and scarcely any have a courtyard. An area with railings separates them from the path. In this basement, the kitchen offices are placed. Coal, bread, meat, brought on a kind of hollowed plank, and all provisions go in that way without causing the master any inconvenience. The stables are generally in separate buildings, sometimes at some distance. Brick is the ordinary basis of construction. English bricks are usually yellow ochre in hue, which, in my opinion, cannot compare with the red and warm tones of our own. Houses built of bricks of this color have a sickly and unwholesome appearance that is disagreeable to the eye. There are rarely more than three stories and these have only two or three windows each, for generally a house is occupied by only one family. A flight of white stone steps, thrown like a drawbridge over the moat, leading to the kitchen offices, connects the house with the street, and the door, painted like oak, is often adorned with a brass plate on which are written the name and quality of the owner. Such are the characteristic features of the real English house. What gives quite an individual aspect to london in addition to the width of its streets and the lowness of its houses is the uniformly black hue that covers everything nothing is sadder or more lugubrious for this black possesses nothing of the brown and strong tints that time gives to old buildings in more southern climes it is an imperceptible and subtle grime that clings to everything penetrates everywhere, and from which nothing can protect itself. You would say that all the monuments were powdered with black lead. The immense quantity of coal consumed in London in warming houses and in furnaces is one of the chief causes of this general mourning of the edifices, the most ancient of which have literally the appearance of having been painted with blacking. This effect is particularly noticeable in the statues. Newgate Prison, with its bossages and worm-eaten stones, the old church of St. Saviour, and some Gothic chapels, the names of which I forget, seem to have been built of black granite, rather than to have been darkened by the years. This prevailing hue would suffice to explain the traditional spleen of the English. The Dome of St. Paul's, a heavy counterfeit of St. Peter's, Rome, an edifice of the family of the Pantheon and the Escurist, with its humped cupola and two square belfries, cruelly suffers from the influence of the London atmosphere. Notwithstanding the efforts to keep it white, it is always black, at least on one side. It is vain to coat it with paint, the imperceptible carbon in solution in the fog works quicker than the painter's brush. St. Paul's is an additional example to prove that the cupola is a form that belongs to the east and that the skies of the north require to be cut by the needles and sharp angles of gothic architecture the london sky even when it is unclouded is of a milky blue in which grey predominates the azure is sensibly paler than that of the sky of france there the evenings and mornings are always bathed in mists and drowned in vapours london steams in the sun like a sweating horse or a boiling cauldron and this produces in open spaces those admirable effects of light so well rendered by the english water-colorists and engravers in the finest weather it is difficult 
clearly to see Southwark Bridge from London Bridge, which, however, are not far apart. This mist that overspreads all, softens all harsh angles, veils the poverty of construction, enlarges the perspective, and gives mystery and vagueness to the most aggressive objects. By its means, a factory chimney easily becomes an obelisk. A shop of mean architecture assumes the air of a Babylonian terrace, and a pitiful row of columns changes into a palmarine portico. The symmetrical aridity of civilization and the vulgarity of the forms she makes use of are softened or disappear entirely thanks to this beneficent veil. The streets were becoming animated. Laborers, with white aprons tied at the waist, were on their way to work. Butcher boys were carrying meat in their wooden troughs. Carriages were passing with the rapidity of lightning. Omnibuses, brilliant with color and varnish, bedizened with gold letters announcing their destinations, followed one another with scarcely an interval, with passengers outside and conductors standing on a ledge beside the door. These omnibuses travel very fast, for London is so vast, so enormous a city, that there the need of rapidity makes itself felt more keenly than in Paris. This activity of locomotion is in strange contrast with the impassive air, and the phlegmatic and cold physiognomy, to say nothing more, of all these imperturbable passengers. The English move quickly like the dead in the ballad, and you cannot read any desire of arriving in their eyes. They run, and they do not seem to be in a hurry. They always go straight ahead like a cannon-ball, do not turn round when jostled, and do not beg pardon when they jostle anyone else. Even the women walk with a quick step that would do honor to grenadiers marching to the assault, and with that geometrical and manly gait by which an Englishwoman is recognized on the continent, and which excites the laughter of the Parisian child. The children, even, make haste on their way to school. The Thames is to London what the boulevard is to Paris, the principal line of circulation. Only on the Thames the omnibuses are replaced by little steamboats. Nothing is more delightful than these little voyages that cause to defile past you, like a moving panorama, the picturesque banks of the river. You thus pass all the bridges of London, you can admire the three iron arches of Southwark Bridge, so bold in strut, so wide in extent. The ionic columns that give such an elegant appearance to Blackfriars Bridge, and the Doric pillars of such robust and solid shape of Waterloo Bridge, surely the finest in the world. On leaving Waterloo Bridge, through the arches of Blackfriars Bridge, you see the gigantic silhouette of St. Paul's rising above an ocean of roofs, among the spires and belfries of St. Marlebone, St. Benet, and St. Matthew, with a portion of a quay thronged with boats, barks, and storehouses. From Westminster Bridge, you discover the ancient abbey of that name, lifting into the haze its two lofty square towers that recall the towers of the notre dame in paris and that have a sharp turret at each angle and the three strange open-work belfries of st john the evangelist without counting the saw-teeth formed by the spires of distant chapels the factory chimneys and the house roofs vauxhall bridge worthily ends the perspective Forgive me if I am always talking of the Thames, but its ceaselessly moving panorama is something so novel and so impressive that it is hard to get away from it. A forest of three masters in the heart of a capital is the finest spectacle that human industry can present to the view. Starting from Waterloo Bridge, we will reach the Strand by Wellington Street and walk along it. From the pretty little church of St. Mary, so singularly situated in the middle of the street, the strand, which is quite wide, is decked on both sides by sumptuous and splendid shops, which, though not possessing, perhaps, the coquettish elegance of those of Paris, yet have an air of wealth and luxurious abundance. Here we find displayed stocks of prints, in which we can admire the masterpieces of the English graver, so supple, so soft, so suggestive of color, and unhappily 
employed upon the worst designs in the world regent street which has arcades like the rue de rivoli piccadilly pall mall haymarket the italian opera which may best be compared with the odeon in paris carlton place and st james park the queen's palace with its triumphant arch imitated from that of the carousel rendered this part of the city one of the most brilliant in london the architecture of the houses or rather of the palaces that constitute this district occupied by the wealthy classes is altogether impressive and monumental although of a hybrid and often equivocal composition never have there been so many columns and pediments even in an antique city surely the greeks and romans were never so greek or roman as the subjects of his britannic majesty you walk between two rows of parthenons that is flattering you see nothing but temples of vesta and jupiter satyr and the illusion would be complete if you do not read among the intercolumnations such inscriptions as gas company and life insurance these colonnades and pediments at first glance do not fail to produce a certain effect of splendor but all this magnificence is for the most part produced by mastic or roman cement for stone is very scarce in london it is in the new churches especially that the english architectural genius displays the most peculiar cosmopolitanism and makes the strangest confusion of styles above an egyptian pylon extends a greek order mingled with open roman arches the whole surmounted by a gothic spire this would make the meanest italian peasant shrug his shoulders with pity with very few exceptions all the modern monuments are in this style the english are rich active and industrious they can forge iron tame steam twist matter in every way and invent machinery of terrifying power they can be great poets but art properly so called will always be lacking to them form in itself will always escape them they feel this and it irritates them it wounds their national pride they understand that at bottom notwithstanding their prodigious material civilization they are merely varnished barbarians lord elgin who was so violently anathematized by lord bryan committed a useless sacrilege the parthenon bas-reliefs did not inspire anybody when brought to london the plastic gift is refused to the nations of the north the sun which places objects in relief accentuates their outlines and gives its true form to everything illumines those pale regions with too oblique array and then the english are not catholics protestantism is as fatal as islamism to the arts and perhaps more so in a country artists can be only pagans or catholics in a country where the temples are only great square chambers without pictures or statues or ornaments where gentlemen in three decker wigs talk to you seriously and with many biblical allusions of papist idols and the great horror of babylon art can never attain great heights for the noblest end of statuary in painting is to fix in marble and on canvas the divine symbols of the religion in use in one's own country and period phidias carved the venus and raphael painted the madonna but neither the one nor the other was anglican london may become rome but she certainly will never be athens the latter position seems to be reserved for paris there we find gold power material development in the highest degree a gigantic exaggeration of all that can be done with money patience and will the useful and the comfortable but not the agreeable and the beautiful here intelligence grace flexibility finesse easy comprehension of harmony and beauty in one word greek qualities the english will excel in all that can possibly be done and more especially in what is impossible they will establish a bible society in peking they will arrive at timbuktu in white gloves and patent leather shoes in a condition of complete respectability they will invent machinery to produce six hundred thousand pairs of stockings a minute and they will 
even discovered new countries in which to market their stockings but they will never make a hat that a french grisette would put on her head if taste could be bought they would pay high for it happily god has reserved to himself the distribution of two or three little things over which the gold of the mighty upon earth has no power genius beauty and happiness however in spite of these criticisms of detail the general effect of london is one that causes astonishment and a sort of stupor it is really a capital in the sense of civilization everything is grand splendid and arranged according to the last degree of perfection if anything the streets are too wide too big too well lighted the care of material facilities is carried to the utmost degree in this respect paris is at least a hundred years behind london the english houses are very flimsily built for the ground they occupy does not belong to the builder the whole land in the city is possessed as in the middle ages by a very small number of great lords or millionaires who permit building operations there for a price this permission is purchased for a certain time and it is so arranged that the house does not last longer than the lease for this reason in addition to the fragility of the materials employed london is renewed every thirty years and is able as they say to follow the progress of civilization added to this the fire of sixteen sixty six made a complete clearance which for my part i greatly regret because i am not greatly fascinated by modern architecture but prefer the picturesque to the comfortable the english spirit is naturally methodical in the streets everybody naturally takes the right-hand side and regular streams of people going up and down are formed a handful of soldiers suffices for london and even police have small occupation i cannot remember having seen a single company of soldiers the policemen with numbered helmet on head and bracelet on sleeve to show that they are on duty stroll about with a tranquil and philosophical air with no other weapons but a little staff hardly two feet in length and thus traverse the most populous districts this immense circulation of people this terrible movement that gives one the vertigo is so to speak left to itself and thanks to the good sense of the throng no accident happens the appearance of the populace is more miserable than in paris with us the workmen the people of the lower orders wear clothes made for them coarse it is true but of a special kind and that evidently has always belonged to them if their vest is in holes to-day we know that originally they wore it when new the grisettes and laborers are neat and clean notwithstanding the simplicity of their dress but in london that is not the case everybody wears a tail-coat a pair of trousers and a tall hat even the wretch who opens the door of your cab the women all wear a hat and a long skirt so that at first sight you think you see women of a superior class who have fallen into distressed circumstances either through misconduct or misfortune this arises from the fact that in london the common people dress in cast-off clothes and from degradation to degradation the coat of a gentleman ends by covering the back of a gutter snipe and the satin bonnet of a duchess covers the head of an ignoble drudge even in st giles in that sad irish quarter which in horror and dirt surpasses anything that can be imagined you see hats and black coats often worn without shirts and buttoned over the skin that shows through their rents st giles however is only a few steps away from oxford street and piccadilly this contrast is very violent without gradual transition you pass from the most glaring opulence to the vilest misery carriages do not go down these alleys full of puddles in which ragged children are crawling and where big girls with dishevelled hair bare legs and arms and a tattered shawl tied across the breast stare at you with a haggard and savage look what suffering what famine is to be read on those faces so emaciated wan cadaverous worn and pinched with cold there you find poor wretches who have always been famished since the day they were born they all live on steamed potatoes and very seldom have bread to eat 
from privation the blood of these unfortunates becomes impoverished and turns from red to yellow as medical men have affirmed on the houses of some of these dwellers in st giles there are such notices as furnished cellar for a single gentleman this ought to give you a sufficient idea of the place i had the curiosity to enter one of these basements and i assure you i have never seen anything so bare it would seem impossible for human beings to exist in such hovels it is true that they die there by the thousand this is the reverse of the metal of every civilization monstrous fortunes are explained by frightful miseries in order that a few may devour a great deal many must fast the higher the palace is raised the deeper must be the foundations and nowhere is this disproportion so manifest as in england to be poor in london seems to me to be one of the tortures forgotten by dante in his spiral of sufferings to possess gold is so visibly the sole recognized merit that the english poor despise themselves and humbly accept the arrogance and disdain of the easy and wealthy classes the english who talk so much about the idols of the papists ought not to forget that the golden calf is the most infamous idol of all and the one that exacts the most sacrifice the squares which are very numerous are a happy corrective of the fetidness of these sewers the place royale in paris can convey the best idea of an english square a square as a space surrounded by houses of uniform architecture the centre being a garden planted with great trees and enclosed by iron railings its sward of emerald green affords delightful repose to eyes tired by the sombre hues of the sky and the edifices the squares often communicate one with another and occupy much ground splendid squares in the vicinity of hyde park are inhabited by the nobility no shop nor storehouse is allowed to disturb the aristocratic quietude of these elegant retreats nothing could be more charming than these extensive enclosures so tranquil green and fresh it is true that i never saw anybody walking in these attractive gardens to which each of the tenants has a key it is sufficient for them to be able to keep others out the squares and the parks form one of the chief charms of london st james park close to pall mall is a delightful promenade you go down into it by a wide flight of steps worthy of babylon which is situated at the foot of the duke of york's column the walk along the egyptian terrace of carlton place is wide and beautiful but what pleased me above all was the large sheets of water thronged with herons ducks and other aquatic birds the english excel in the art of giving to artificial gardens a romantic and natural appearance westminster the towers of which peep above the clumps of trees admirably closes the view on the river side hyde park where the horses and carriages of fashion parade looks quite rural and countrified by the extent of its water and green slopes it is not a garden but a landscape you are astonished to find such large open spaces in a city like london regent's park that contains the zoological gardens and is bordered by palaces in the style of the garde moubelle and the minister of marine in paris is truly enormous you can lose yourself in it an undulation of the surface of which very skilful use has been made produces most picturesque effects End of A Day in London by Theophile Gautier